We are half a minute short of 17.30, so, but I, I think I should get started. I'm sure that all of you have got this copy. Um, eventually, probably, if I do a good job at introducing these two gentlemen, I might get a hard, cup, a hard cover copy in the process, but we'll see. Um, thank you all for coming to attend this book launch uh, of our permanent fellow and, uh, um, and Steers, uh, Donald Gordon Fellow at, at, at Steers. He's been a very good ambassador of, of Steers and it's very nice to have the opportunity for Steers to do at least something and create an opportunity for launching yet another book uh, that uh, will be spoken to and discussed uh, in the process. So I would like to welcome you all uh, for the visitors that are coming to STEERS for the first time. Uh, my name is Edward, um, uh, Professor Edward Chirumira, um, uh, the director of STEERS. So I would like to welcome you all. I would like to welcome um, the fellows that are joining and all the people that are joining online a special welcome uh, to Professor Edgar Peterson, whom I will briefly introduce, and in turn, he will not only introduce the author, but also will lead uh, the discussion of the book, as well as moderate uh, Q&A if time allows. Edgar Peterson is a professor in the School of Architecture and Planning at the University of Cape Town. Um, and was holder of the DST NRF South African Research Chair in Urban Policy between 2008 and 2022. He is founding and current director of the African Center for Steers at the University of Cape Town. So when he's at Steers, we kind of forget the directorship and call him fellow of Steers because Edgar is a fellow uh, at and of uh, steers, and once a fellow, always a fellow. Uh, but for now, we will uh, say director um, uh, of the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town. He's published greatly, and I won't go into detail in that, but I also mentioned that he became an invited member of the Club of Rome from June 2021 uh, until now. And also since last year, he's provost for the Norman Foster Institute for Sustainable Cities. Uh, his research and teaching ex ex explore urban imaginaries, alternative futures, sustainable urban infrastructure, placemaking, public cultures, responsive design, and adaptive governance system. So you see why he's going to be the conversationalist with uh, Ian uh, Golding in this book. His voice and contributions are distinctive given that he moves effortlessly between academic, public policy, and creative domain. He actually curates exhibitions. Uh, so let me ask uh, Edgar to come and curate Ian Golden's book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edward. That is a very generous introduction. Um, and it is an absolute delight to be back at Stias. It is a second home. And I'm very pleased that um, I've been allowed back into the fold later in the year. So I'm looking forward to my stint from August until October, um, and, uh, and I'm especially looking forward to what's happened to the menu in the intermediary years. Um, so it is uh, really intimidating to introduce Ian, uh, you know, when you kind of read on anyone's CV, this is his 24th book, you kind of, Ugh, what have I done with my life? Um, but uh, Ian is a professor of globalization and development at the University of Oxford. Um, and there he's been central in establishing and growing the footprint of the Oxford Martin School. And currently, after he's been the founding director there until 2016, he's leading some of their larger programs. 
for example, on technological and economic change, the future of work, and the future of development. During that time that he was director of school, uh, they were able to build out 45 programs of research, bringing together more than 500 academics from across the Oxford system and from over 100 disciplines. Um, and if that can be done at Oxford, you can just imagine uh, what kind of fortitude Ian carries into the world. But he's also had a life of professional service. He worked as vice president at the World Bank. And before that, he was head of development policy there. But he also served uh, in the Development Bank of Southern Africa. And that was between 96 and 2001, where he was chief executive and managing director. And Ian, uh, as wheels turn, I'm just joined the board of the DBSA in October last year. So it would be great to, uh, to hear more about how one navigates those, uh, those particular walls. And in that role, uh, he was um, privileged to serve also as an advisor to President Nelson Mandela. He holds multiple degrees, including from the University of Cape Town, London School of Economics, and of course, the University of Oxford. Now, we're here to discuss his latest book, as I said, his 24th book, and at the current rate, uh, you know, it's, he's at the halfway mark, I suspect. Um, and uh, it is titled Age of the City. So as an urbanist, and I just call myself that because I'm really just a mongrel that doesn't have a disciplinary home, so it's nice to be able to say I'm an urbanist. Um, I am absolutely delighted that an intellectual leader that is able to move between the academy, uh, the worlds of, of, of senior leadership in public policy, and also um, innovation with regard to how to bring the private sector into the sustainable development conversation. I'm delighted that he's turned his attention to something that of course is very dear to my heart because it's puzzled me for the longest possible time that within the development world, the centrality and the foundational nature of settlement and particularly urban life and the promise of innovation that urbanism offers was not really in the conversation. In fact, Ian will, I'm sure, confirm during his time at the World Bank that there was this belief that Africa's success would come from a successful agrarian revolution, a successful transition into uh, um, uh, agricultural transformation and productivity that will lift everyone out of poverty. Cities was just never a priority. Today we know better, and no least because of the impacts of climate change, we know better because we understand that cities and good cities is foundational to growth, productivity, expansion, and innovation. And we also know that it is the aggregate of the pinnacle of, as a species, how we express ourselves, our culture, our art, our aesthetic expansion, and the construction of collective identities. Now, given the state of the world, given where we are, we really need our cities to perform better, to deliver on the promise of urbanism. And there are many reasons why this is not happening. And what we have today is someone who's applied his considerable experience and incredible brain power to try and decipher across a wide set of discussions and debates, why are cities failing us? Where are the examples where cities are in fact getting it right? And how can we think from that practice about what possible solutions could be? And this is such a critical conversation because we, over the next 25 years, all urban expansion, let me be uh, statistically correct, 95% of urban growth will be in Africa and Asia. And you, can, you know the state of our cities, the challenges we face on the continent. So if we are gonna see a doubling, a trebling of urban populations, where do we begin? So with that background note, I want to invite Ian to kick us off and tell us why he decided to write this book and what the main messages are that he hopes his readers will take from it. Ian. Thank you very much. Uh Edgar, and thank you, Edward. Um, this book, like a few of the previous books I've written, is really a Steers product. Um, 
I'm able to write books because I have this wonderful creative space for the mind that Steers provides. So thank you uh, to Edward, your predecessors, uh, and all the incredible staff at Steers who make that possible. Uh, that's really, if you want to know the secret of my books, it's spend time at Steers. Um, certainly that's been the secret of my recent books. And thanks to you, uh, Edgar, for agreeing to enter into this discussion with me, not only because I respect your work and your thoughts on this, and you know a lot more about cities than I do, so it's rather intimidating. But also, I've just realized that you're actually my boss. Um, I didn't know that because you're the prov I didn't realize you were the provost of the Norman Foster um, Institute, which uh, I'm now teaching at in, in Madrid as well. So uh, thanks for agreeing to, uh, to my being on that. Uh, and uh, we'll have lots to chat about and how that's going to go. The reason um, I thought it was important, and I wrote this book with uh, Tom Lee Devlin, who started off as my research assistant, but really was so great and contributed so much that I thought it was absolutely fair and right uh, that he be a co-author. And on the back of that, he got a job at The Economist, which is as you know, a place where people who can write well uh, and succinctly tend uh, to want to go uh, in that world. Um, is because I feel that there is a real danger that in this we are able to rethink cities, uh, defend cities, advance what's happening in cities, and that there won't be any solution to the world's major problems. In other words, our future does depend what happens on what happens in cities. Um, of course, there are many other things that are important too, like what happens in rural areas, what happens in agriculture, etc. But if we don't get cities right, we can't get anything else right. And we certainly can't address the biggest challenges facing humanity. There are a number of reasons for that. One is the sort of obvious arithmetical reason that well over half the world's population lives in cities, another three million people joining them every week, uh, within 25 years, two-thirds of the world's population. We are now, Homo sapiens is no longer a species defined by being on the savannah or being in rural areas, but we're defined by what we do and how we achieve things in cities. So that's a very obvious reason. If you have the overwhelming majority of the world's population in cities, their future depends on what happens in cities. Um, the second is because cities are not only where people are, and therefore their material conditions, their psychological state of mind and so on matters, uh, but also because it's the source of all the solutions. Uh, the more I've worked on creativity and innovation, which has been the subject of some other books I've worked on, the more I'm convinced that it's about people coming together, often diverse people, uh, and so on. And all great change in the world, all great civilizations, have come out of cities. Progress is defined by people in cities coming together in interesting ways and between cities uh, and doing things in new ways. I, I did a book um, which compared our time to the Renaissance uh, uh, in 2016, Age of Discovery, and I was absolutely intrigued as to why this all happened in Florence, in such a small, concentrated place. Uh, and that really was one of the reasons I became absolutely intrigued about the role of cities, this creative uh, space, like Steers is, but at the city uh, level. It's also the case that I think that cities are under attack, and that sort of comes to the question of why now? Um, we've, we're seeing a number of phenomena which are pushing back against cities very strongly. The most obvious one is the sort of populist politics. Uh, anti-metropolitan elite, whether it's London or San Francisco and New York, Paris. We're seeing it in the protests, we're seeing it in the politics of populism, which is essentially an anti-big city movement. Um, and we're certainly seeing it in the US in the politics of Trump, etc., which will no doubt be aggravated as he uh, becomes a persona non grata in New York. Uh, the, that is an extremely dangerous one. What follows from that is something which is, I think, absolutely right, which is a leveling up agenda where 
we try and improve the incomes of those in left behind places and restore them. But the great danger in that agenda, I believe, is a leveling down agenda. In other words, everyone becomes worse off because of uh, the attacks on dynamic cities, political attacks and uh, financial attacks. Time in history. cities, the, basically the economics of cities become undermined, whether it's the buskers and the baristas and the ecosystem around offices, the, ver the valuation of offices, which of course is a major source of income for major cities, um, as well as public transport systems which depend on major footfall at certain hours, etc. And, and if the economics of big cities uh, become undermined, and we're seeing it in many, many big cities around the world, by the way, remote work is particularly an Anglo-Saxon phenomena. So this is much less a concern in uh, mainland Europe, in Asia, and other places, and we can go into the reasons for that. Um, then cities are being undermined by that. It's also the case that, that city, cities came to the fore in the pandemic because they were the super spreaders of the pandemic and everyone didn't want to be near other people. Um, and if you were in a city, you became very isolated. If you could get out of the city, you got out of the city. Um, so this question about how do you make cities uh, the circuit breakers rather than the super spreaders of, of contagious diseases really came. address emissions in cities, energy systems, transport systems, buildings, the construction of buildings, concrete and cement, oh, major uh, steel, major carbon emitters in the process. And you talked about the growth of cities. There's no way we can produce future cities like we produced past cities without in a zero carbon world, which raises many, many, many questions. Um, but cities are also heat islands. They tend to be two to seven degrees hotter than places around them. And so uh, people suffer more in cities. And that is a particular suffering associated with inequality. You know, one of the intriguing things is that the most, some of the most dynamic and fast growing cities in the world are in deserts, like Abu Dhabi and Dubai and Phoenix and Las Vegas. If you have enough money, you can live in a cocoon, and you can pump water from further and deeper or desalinate it, but that's not an option for the people that are moving into cities now. So we need to rethink cities in order to be able to address climate change in all dimensions, and how this happens and where it will happen is important. The other thing I became aware of which drove me to this book while I was writing Rescue was this question of loneliness and, and isolation and psychological ill health. And, and this great paradox of cities that it seems that people feel most lonely in them. Uh, and, and the statistics are really startling when you start looking at the data on suicides, on, uh, on depression, etc. And it got much worse, of course, in the pandemic because people were isolated. Trying to understand the reasons for this, trying to understand how you can make cities more livable, how you can improve the well-being physical and particularly mental, but also physical in cities, how you redesign and rethink them 
is a very, very important issue, particularly given changing demographics and the collapse of families and the rise of single people. And the final uh, reason I thought it was very important is because my whole career I've been interested in inequality and development. That's basically what I think uh, I've been working on for the last 40 years. And, and I came to realize, again, this was really brought to the fore by, by some of the other work I've done, my book, Terra Incognita, which defined the contours of, of inequality, that um, the question of inequality within cities and between cities and other places is absolutely central to the, how we address and solve the problem of inequality in our societies. It goes back to the populism, it goes back to some of these other questions, but we have to address inequality in our cities and this question of inequality between cities and left behind places if we want to address. This is true of rich countries and it's true of, true of poor countries. Um, and that's why I think a, a book on cities is, is it timely now. Thanks, Ian. Um, so, I mean, I'll come back to quite a few of the themes because I think <clears throat> that's it. I'd love to explore some of them further. But one of the distinctive parts of the book is it is it is written in a in a very elegant integrated synthetic way which draws in a much larger constituency into the debates and conversations and as someone who suffers the uh, the opacity of academic discourse in various dimensions of this debate i was very happy that i could read it in a weekend so thank you for that but one of the things that I really appreciated about the book is the uh, insistence that it is important to take a long historical perspective in understanding what shapes phenomena today, but also to figure out why are there differences across regions, within countries, within cities, etc. So this deliberate historicized approach, uh, could you say a little bit more about that? Because you, know, you could have written this book with a very presentist focus. And I thought that that was a really important dimension of, of the text overall. It's not just in the first chapter where you set the deep history, but you come back to this longitudinal view, and particularly the arc of industrialization and how that shaped urban form and urban dynamics. Yeah. We are shaped by our past. Everything is shaped by our past. And unless we understand that, uh, we can't grapple with the present or the future. You know, that, that, and that's always been a the theme that's run through, through work I've done. It's certainly a the theme of my next book, which is history, on, which is very much a historical perspective on migration. Um, geographical space. We are prisoners of, you know, geography, to use Tim Marshall's term. This is a space defined by things created in the past for all sorts of reasons which are totally unrelated to the present. And unless we can grapple with this tension between the past and the present, we can't overcome it. So why are places where they are? Why are people where they are? Why are industries where they are? Why is this geography as it is? Is a historical question and has to be addressed by answering. It's also a historical question is why are cities more dynamic than other places? Why has changed come from cities? What sort of things happen in cities that don't happen elsewhere? Uh, why have cities grown so rapidly? I mean, one of the fascinating things I learned is that it's a very, very new phenomenon. The cities as we know them today, I mean, they're only a couple hundred years old. Uh, and many cities are only 50 years old in the way we know them uh, today. But very recent, and what was happening before, and what, what's the change in that? Of course, in South Africa, this is particularly relevant, because if any place is trapped by its history, it's South Africa. You know, the apartheid imprint on this country has shaped it in the most dramatic way from anywhere else. And that is a particular So, to come to some of the topics, one of the issues that you foreground in thinking about the emergence of cities
yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, the, uh, I mean, one of the things I learned in doing the book, which, which I knew in other contexts, but not in this context of cities, and is indeed the subject of my group, research group on technological and economic change, is how intimately related the physical structure of cities is to technological innovations over time. Uh, I mean, the, the biggest one, of course, is, is the, the ability to create agricultural surplus, um, which, without which there would be no cities. We'd all be working in the fields or in agriculture. And it's, it's that and subsequent improvements in it that really crystallize it. And then things like much later, and, but cities don't really grow until the 1800s. They're very, very small. The biggest cities were less than a million people until the 1800s. Now we have cities of 40 million people. Uh, and there, there are thousands of cities over a million people, whereas there's only one until the 1800s. Uh, so that is about technologies of transport, railroad first, refrigeration, elevators, uh, absolutely central, air conditioning much later, uh, absolutely central to that. And it's, and it's, the, it's really the car in the 1910s and subsequently that allows us before in where there were suburban railroads or subway cars and things like that, um, you, you got some of that. But the real sprawl begins with the car. And um, that's when you see this explosion. And a lot of inner cities are still the same size. London is, for example, in terms of population density that it was in 1800. What's, I mean, it, or, or 1900, the big difference is you add on, you burst the seams and you add on the suburbs. Um, and that's the, the big transformation that comes with, with, with uh, cars. I think when, you know, fast forward, where, does, where do we go and how do we rethink this? We, we have to get into much greater densification. That's because we need to do it in terms of climate footprints. We particularly have to do that in um, developing countries. Currently, cities take up about 1% of, of land mass in the world. Uh, they're very small. I think that's a good thing. I think we should take up less land mass. You know, there's, there's a lot of my friends who want to get back to nature and want to say, the solution is that we should all leave the cities and go and live in the countryside. That would be a total disaster. Uh, in terms of the eco ecology of rural areas, but also in terms of climate change, because people in, in rural areas have something like two to five times the carbon footprint and emissions footprint of people living in dense urban areas. Um, there are lots of reasons for that, the main one, and that's sort of incidentally behind the protests you see in France of the Gilets Jaunes and so on, is trying to reduce uh, farmers transport uh, amount that they travel. Um, but the, the, the densification is the answer. But not the densification we know now, a densification which is also creating communities where you're overcoming loneliness, where you're moving to 15 mini cities. The other thing that's happened with suburbanization um, and the, the hollowing out of cities, now regentrification, but the hollowing out. Uh, of it through ghettos and so on. Is, and that this was really accelerated by the Thatcher-Reagan uh, revolution and the decline in state funding, is that clubs and societies and social gatherings have basically uh, declined dramatically. Uh, there's something like the third of the number of clubs, societies, uh, and so on in the UK today as they were 70 years ago, despite the population having grown very significantly. And that's partly that all public funding for these things has been withdrawn. The space isn't there, and people's attitudes about this individualization have changed. Uh, there's also been, of course, a retreat, which there's a chapter on into the cybersphere, uh, virtual, virtual connectivity as opposed to physical. Now, there are many cities that teach us how to do this differently. Uh, and that's one of the great things about cities, is that uh, whatever one feels depressed about the potential of governments to solve problems. 
Uh, and, and that's something that people in many countries feel pretty depressed about. Cities are solving problems everywhere. Uh, there's lots of city-based, community-based solutions to the big challenges we face um, on multiple dimensions, including these questions of social isolation, uh, et cetera. And what the book points to is these good examples, because they can be adopted. You don't need the national government to say you can do this and this and this. The great example, of course, here in Stellenbosch, um, which uh, Nigel Shadbolt is now working on, um, is this Adam Tess corridor. Uh, and the rethinking of Stellenbosch in a, to try and overcome uh, the devastating legacy uh, of segregation uh, based on race in, in, in the city. Uh, and rethinking how you do that, which will be good for everyone uh, in the city. So there are amazing initiatives happening. Uh, I think they do mean we're going to have to wean ourselves uh, of our addiction to cars. Even if we move to EV, uh, they are not, they still, you know, st they're still made of steel or weathered products which have a big uh, imprint. And it's this question of, and traffic jams. I mean, you were telling me how long it took you to, to get from Cape Town to here. Uh, public transport has to uh, be a big part of the solution, plus much more localization. Uh, and the big question for suburbanization, which you raised, is how do you have thriving suburban areas with new suburban focus areas, which are not going to be malls, um, without destroying the inner city, the commerce, etc., of the inner city? How do you balance this out? And the other big challenge of suburbanization has been that we used to have poor people in the center of a city, wealthier people moving out, and there's no pub, and now, and so the spines of public transport in virtually all cities are from the center out, bringing workers and uh, middle class people, employers in and out of the city on public transport systems. If you start making suburbs the new centers of economic activity, you have a big problem that people that are in poor suburbs can't get there except by going into town and coming out again. And so this requires a rethinking as well of public transport to be much more around the concentric circles of the city um, than uh, Elsby. And then that, that, of course, touches on another question that you posed, which is regarding um, the increase in affluence in inner cities, the gentrification of inner cities. And that, that I think, is here to stay, because that's about that's something which only inner cities and dynamic places can do, which is they create very exciting to places to be for diverse populations, particularly young people. And what cities do, which no rural area can do, is they give you a choice of lifestyle. And it, you will find like-minded people in physical space in a city that you cannot find. Just to touch on your question on real estate markets, um, you're absolutely right, and I think I should have spent more time uh, on that. Um, there's many things that can be said about property markets, and I, I have worked on, uh, uh, on them and, and engaged with them uh, in some extent, and I'm, I've had to in some other ways, because I'm on some investment committees where I worry about the valuations of property. Um, there's a lot of gaming. Uh, property is probably about the most corrupt sector when it comes to politics. Uh, so there's a lot of ties to regulation and uh, zoning and all of those questions. Um, but there's also huge distortions built by things that we need to change. One is the insurance market. So a lot of people don't know what the risk is of their house being flooded because the insurer will pay or whatever. And it's completely distorted housing markets, particularly in the US, uh, where people build where they really shouldn't build. Uh, because they're going to be bailed out, whether it's a flood, a coastal flood, or whether it's a fire. Uh, so we need to think about that, and it also increases inequality greatly. The second thing that isn't priced in at all is catastrophe, because the government also bails you out on that in the US. And um, 
that when you, kn when you know for almost certain that oceans are going to rise by two to five meters this century, there's going to be much more storms and hurricanes and saline intrusion and much more instability in water, like Cape Town experienced at Zero Water Day. And then you see the price of properties in coastal areas at sea, you say, what is happening? How can this be that Florida's, Miami's enjoying a boom when we know it'll be underwater? And that goes back to real estate markets. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, there's uh, another issue that you raise in the book, in the chapter on leveling up, and it reminded me of, um, of a very interesting set of challenges we've been facing in South Africa and dealing with national spatial systems and where do you invest. So in 19, and you probably know this story, but allow me to share it with the audience as an anecdote. Um, so in 1988, um, the, um, the presidency produces a report, the National Spatial Development Perspective. And essentially this report says, if we look at the limited capital available in the national budget, the massive needs across the country, we should only put economic infrastructure in places with growth potential. And the rest of the country should only get basic infrastructure. So you can imagine in 1988 how controversial that was. Uh, as a political and a policy position for the national cabinet to take. Uh, president Mbeki immediately locked that up in a vault, or a deputy president at the time, and it only saw the light of day five years later when he was president and there was a stronger policy unit within the presidency. Fast forward to the NDP in 2012 and then the Integrated Urban Development Framework in 2016, and that question has still not been resolved because DTI, has insisted on a national investment strategy that is about lifting up deprived areas and therefore not putting limited capital in the areas with growth potential. So a good example would be the Kucha investment in the Eastern Cape. It's complete white elephant. We've pumped billions and billions and billions of rands into that. Of course, it's over time become a source of rent seeking. But there's a big unresolved question. How do you reconcile the need, if you have limited capital, massive need, a, a national economy that is differentially integrated into global markets, you need vital economic infrastructure like we've seen the collapse of the Durban port in the last couple of months and so on. How do you deal with this leveling, leveling up challenge given that spatial geography, that economic geography? And I'm just using the South African case as an example because hopefully that resonates with everyone in the room. Um, but the, for this is, of course, a question everywhere, and it's highly politicized, as you've just mentioned, referring to the recent protests, again, of the French farmers. Yeah. I think this is, you know, an absolutely central question. Uh, it's a central question in South Africa, as it is in Britain, as it is everywhere. Um, China, the U.S., everywhere. Incidentally, on Kucha, <laughs> one of the things I am glad about is that I never agreed to the DBSA funding Kucha. Um, but I certainly got the delegations, including many ministerial delegations, telling me how brilliant it would be. So I'm not at all glad it's a white elephant, but I am feeling a bit of uh, sang froid at that. So um, my view is that it is much
I used to be able to get there in this place near Chicago by public transport, but there are no buses anymore. They've stopped, and I can't afford a car. I can get there, but my wife can't get, has a job, or I have an elderly parent, or I have kids in school, and they can't get school places, or I can't get my parent into a camp. That's the reason people don't move. It's those practical things that lock you into the past. Now, these things have always been there, but they're much, much worse. You know, the rate of mobility in the US between different states is less than a half of what it was in the 1970s. Less than half. And that's because of this combination of things happening from, the, again, from the Thatcher-Reagan revolution, the decline in public schooling, the decline in um, public transport, the decline in public housing. In the UK, the public housing stops, stocks virtually evaporated after the privatization for people that want to move. Um, those are the practical reasons. No care places for your parents, etc. So, if you want people to move, you have to address the reasons they don't move. And it comes down to those questions. And unless we address those questions, we're going to have growing inequality between dynamic cities and left behind places. Because you cannot overcome the dynamism I mean, you can try to, but you won't succeed, I think, except by destroying the whole economy of dynamic places. And they will become more and more and more dynamic. The network effects of the knowledge economy, the agglomeration effects of the knowledge economy, and the benefits of diversity, particularly for young people, overwhelm any reasons to stay anywhere else and any jobs to go anywhere else. You can throw a lot of money as people try to throw at Kucha and the apartheid state threw a lot of money at the homelands, trying to make them economically viable. When I arrived at the DBSA, one of the most memorable images I have is this massive safe, you know, the size of my office here, next to my office, with nothing in it, except sort of storage for files. And I asked the people there, what's the safe for? And they said, this is where we had stored the money that we used to helicopter to the homelands. Um, Okay, um, that's the waste of money. And the, that spatial job. Now, you cannot say, and you particularly cannot say that in a constituency politics country like the UK, your future, my constituent, is to leave town and go to London. You know you, know you won't be reselected um, if you say that. But where I think we should be pushing for is minimum delivery standards which are national. But everyone in our country will have the following things. They will have health care, they will have schooling, they will have postal service, they will have electricity, they will have things that everyone, uh, telecommunications access, broadband, etc., wherever they are. That we will guarantee our citizens and we will pay for it out of the wealth that's generated by the big cities. I believe absolutely in the leveling up in terms of a contract between citizens in a society that no one will be below a certain level. That's very different to saying to people, I guarantee you a job where you are, uh, or I offer you a job. And it's dishonest, I believe, to be giving people hope that they can stay in places and that their children should stay in places where they would be much better off if they moved, and we have to help them move. I also believe in things like housing vouchers, for example, to help people move. Means to help people move and creating greater flexibility in our societies is important. And I think this will be good. You know, the reason places are where they are is for reasons to do with the Industrial Revolution, is where the water was, where the coal was, where the slave ships came in. They were very different reasons. Those are not the reasons that are going to generate economic growth or jobs in the future. I've got a few more questions, but I, I'm keeping track of time, and I, we want to also give you an opportunity. I'm sure there's quite a lot that Ian said that has provoked uh, both uh, guttural responses and intellectual responses. Uh, so I just want to give you an opportunity to pose a set of questions 
and then uh, I'll, I'll close up with a few uh, words of thanks at the end. But yeah, the floor is open for some questions from the floor for the next 10 minutes. Please, uh, just please introduce yourself very briefly. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, I'm Dave Richardson. Um, um, I noted that you said that um, it was much more ecologically sensible to have people in the cities than in the, in the rural areas. Um, I've not read your book yet, but, but I'd be interested to know if you think there's a role for nature-based solutions to m make cities more livable, more more of a friendly um, and and, uh, and crime-free, for instance. Yes, absolutely. And I don't want anyone to think I'm anti-rural, anti-agriculture. I've written other books which are, you know, defending rural areas of agriculture and uh, the environment and nature-based solutions. The question is, how do we best get there? And of course, there's some places which are so beautiful, like Stellenbosch. Um, and many many places which will thrive out of being the entry points to to nature. I think nature-based solutions creating and it's part of the redesign of urban areas. I mean, we really have to change the geography of urban areas. Have much more green spaces. And I've visited some cities. Interestingly, Singapore, you know, which is one of the densest places on earth, uh, all new buildings have to be green buildings, and they look. tension between urban space and nature. Uh, of course you can have, and there are many examples, and Norman Foster has been tremendous uh, in showing us this, not only how you can create nature-based solutions, but also how you can completely redesign buildings. Um, I went with him around the Bloomberg building in London that he uh, designed. It has, its air conditioning needs are virtually zero because of the design of the building. Uh, in terms of nature-based solutions and design questions. And, and this is also true, of course, of the countryside. So absolutely is the answer. also generate a series of social <coughs> enterprise and green employment in informal economies where there aren't formal jobs available. So there's a real paradigm shift happening in the whole conversation around slum upgrading, um, which is very much informed by, I think, the really important breakthroughs in how the nature-based solutions agenda has been translated into design instruments, uh, both from at the building level, at the neighborhood scale, and, and so on. So yeah, so it's, it's a really fertile area of work at the moment. Further questions, uh, reflections, please. Yeah, um, thanks, Chris. I, I talk about that in the book a bit, because it was um, it was a, it's an it's an old idea from the 1800s, really. But then it came into being uh, 
in the post-war period uh, with the creation of Welling Garden City and even Milton Keynes <laughs> was, was and, and, and many others, um, as well as what were then outer suburbs of inner cities like Hampstead Garden Suburb and so on. Um, I think that the, the essential problem is that th they weren't jobs and they became commuter towns. Um, uh, so they were, you know, they were connected by rail, but basically they became commuter towns. And this goes back to this question of can you take jobs to people and how do you take jobs to people? Interestingly enough, now I think they will be more successful now than they were then, in a sense, because because of the knowledge-based economy and remote work and so on. Uh, but um, the it's that essential problem, and I think the answer is that we c we can't just keep building more and more towns and more and more countryside. We need to find ways in which we can make our towns and our existing cities much greener. How we create you know, the gardening of inner cities and of cities is, is I think, where the solution uh, lies. We have time for one more question, I think, please. Uh, can you just wait for the microphone, please? It's coming. Period, you've held executive positions. Uh, you've had the ear of significant decision makers. Uh, you've backed your writing and your views with tremendous authority and uh, tremendous science and data and so on. And I think uh, we should be grateful for that. Well, certainly, I'm grateful for that. Notwithstanding some notable examples and very, very commendable uh, improvements. Why is it that we still have such poor uptake, uh, such poor response by the powers that be, by the decision makers, to um, directions and visions that are uh, very realistically mapped in your work? Thanks, Ian, for that very generous <laughs> um, introduction to your question. Um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's always a question as to why, why don't, and I'm not claiming this for myself, this is true in general, why, why doesn't um, academic work or scholarly work or policy work that seems sensible get traction, which I think is your question, uh, and why do leaders and, and others do different things to what seems like the logical approach. Uh, and we see that it seems getting worse, actually, if we look at some of the politics that's happening in different places. Uh, people are really, you know, we even in this world where people say experts are the problem, facts don't matter, whatever. Uh, and that's not only true in social sciences, it's true even in medicine, where people are ignoring scientific evidence on vaccines or on anything else, climate change. Um, so that's, a, I think, a very deep question. And what does one do about that? Uh, the, my own view is that there's a battle of ideas in the world. And that unless one engages in that battle, uh, one can't begin to change things. It's not to say your ideas are right, and certainly science, the whole premise of science is based on the idea that someone else will have a better idea at some point, but will climb on the shoulders of previous uh, scientists. Um, but that there's this process of churn uh, in which ideas become dominant. Now what we're seeing is that sensible people don't like arguing. Uh, and don't like shouting, and retreat, uh, and don't get engaged. And so that increasingly the battle of ideas is dominated by screaming matches in social media or whatever, which are fact-free generally. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's a very worrying 
tendency where soundbite and uh, whatever it is, allegiance counts more than evidence or research. Um, I'm not totally gloomy, because if you look around the world, uh, there's been enormous progress. You know, we're just caught up in the short term when we think about things. If you look at something like climate change, uh, the, the vast majority of people in the US now believe that climate change is real. They didn't 20 years ago. Um, if you look at economic policy, which I'm intimately involved in, no one even debates whether, you, whether low inflation or macro orthodoxy is a thing anymore that one should aspire to. It's just become the accepted wisdom. It certainly wasn't 40 years ago. Um, and there's all sorts of other things that people have come to. If you look at something like HIV AIDS, if you look at gender diversity and gender identification, just huge transformation in the way that we, people think. Ireland's currently got a gay prime minister who's not Caucasian. I mean, this is unimaginable even 25 years ago. Uh, that that would happen in Catholic Ireland. So people do change. Better ideas do win over b other ideas. It happened in South Africa. Apartheid came to an end. We're in the birth pangs of a new democracy here. Uh, it seems like the US is also in the birth pangs of a relatively young democracy. Um, so, you know, what just, I think, has to keep at it and keep going, but also recognize that we need to think about how we communicate in new ways and not only preach to the choirs that we sing in, um, to th work out how you, why is it that people, I mean, this is the big, why, and this, again, why I want to do this book, why do people believe so angrily about the metropolitan elite destroying their lives? What is it? And it's real. They are worse off, and they not, don't have a future. Um, so I think one has to, a lot of empathy goes a long way to helping one understand why people have such what might seem like views that don't coincide with the ones that you think are more sensible. Thanks, Ian. We've got to draw proceedings to a close. Uh, there's a wine stand awaiting us, if that's not, uh, if I'm not wrong, Edward. Um, but more importantly, there's a pile of books that, where you can purchase your own copy and you can encounter Ian's mind uh, more intimately and he's available to sign copies uh, if you've already bought before the event or if you're going to buy it afterwards. I want to thank Stias for the invitation to be part of this conversation, and I'm one of those academics who never read, so it is great to be forced to read a book in a weekend. Um, so thanks, Edward, for the invitation, and uh, also for always the fantastic logistics and everything organized. But of course, uh, uh, especially thanks, Ian, to you for, um, in the light of the last question, fighting the good fight, being in there in the battle of ideas, and insisting that there are ways through very complex, knotted problems that we can apply uh, rigor and we can apply compassion. As a takeaway for me, I see this as the first of two volumes. Um, the second volume that I'm hoping I can persuade you to write will not only start with a global perspective in terms of the historical origins of urbanism in cities, but really engage with the reality that uh, Global South Cities is uh, the 21st century. A lot of your empirical reference points and examples, of course, stem mainly from the European and the North American context in this book, and fascinatingly so. I mean, you know, I've learned an enormous amount, and it's absolutely crucial that we keep a global perspective. But I am curious what your perspective and lens would tell us about the transformations China is going through, what we're seeing unfolding as India is going to birth 100 million plus cities over the next 30, 40 years, um, what we can learn from the incredible transformation in Kuala Lumpur uh, as they've really taken one of the most polluted contexts and brought nature-based solutions right into the heart of the urban renewal project and so forth and so forth. Um, because, you know, at the moment, and I was reflecting on this, when we have an imagination about the future of cities, it is very difficult to have a counterpoint to 
um, Blomkamp's District 9, right? I mean, that's our imaginative reference point. What is the counterpoint to that? Can anyone in this room think of a single uh, uh, literary or science fiction invocation that is not dystopian? And, and, and I think it's your kind of scholarship and, uh, and in a way pointing to where we should be looking and where we should be heading in collectively problem solving uh, that is desperately needed. So on that note, I look forward to volume two. And thanks, Ian, for sharing your wisdom with us. <laughs>